Good morning, everyone. Looks like the back doors have closed, so we'll begin. My name is Hal Quinn. I'm a community pediatrician at Mercer Island Pediatrics and an occasional attendee of Grand Rounds. Dr. Mays was uh, on vacation this week and asked if I would be willing to introduce our speaker, and I would be happy to do so. Uh, Aaron Whiteman did his, uh, got his MD degree at Case Western University and came and did a Master's of Arts in Bioethics at the University of Washington, did his residency in pediatrics at the University of Washington as well. He is an assistant professor in the University of Washington's Department of Pediatrics, Divisions of Nephrology, Bioethics, and Palliative Care. He's on faculty at the Truman Cat Center for Pediatric Bioethics and is adjunct faculty in the Department of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Washington. Today, he's going to be speaking on medical decision making in children with complex, uh, complex illnesses. Thank you, Dr. Whiteman. Are we, uh, can you hear me okay? Great. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Quinn, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, the title of my presentation today is What is Best and Whose Interests Count? Rethinking the Best Interest Standard in Pediatric Chronic Disease. And I have nothing in the way of financial disclosures with the exception that a substantial portion of my salary is attributed to the care of children with complex chronic diseases. Um, this is kind of a, a longer talk that goes over a number of the projects I've been working on in the last several years. And I, I, while the citations will be on the screen, I want to acknowledge a number of collaborators uh, that I have worked with along the way. Now, as, uh, as Dr. Quinn mentioned, I'm a pediatric nephrologist and bioethicist. And, and my scholarship is devoted to better understanding, learning about, and trying to improve medical decision making for children with complex chronic illnesses. In my clinical practice, that's children with chronic kidney disease, children with end-stage kidney disease, those who receive dialysis and kidney transplants. These are conditions that are uncurable, but treatable, albeit with significant burden. And I was at a transplant conference a number of years ago, and a, a transplant biologist was giving a talk and put up this aphorism attributed to Euripides, noting that Euripides was the patron uh, playwright of transplant biology. And I looked at it and thought he was describing me. So, Taking our inspiration from Euripides, this morning uh, we will question the role of best interest and the best interest standard in medical decision making in chronic disease. I hope that you'll learn something, but more than that, I, I hope that I'll make clear that, that much more work in this field is needed. More specifically, we'll define and apply the best interest standard in pediatric medical decision making, and then we'll identify some of the limitations that occur when applying the best interest standard in pediatric chronic disease. Particularly, we'll focus on limitation, or, uh, problems that can occur in the setting of uncertainty and a lack of data that are impacted by our understanding of the nature of life-sustaining treatments, when we're limited in our ability to interpret the interests for the child, and finally, when considering the interests of others. But first, let's define the best interest standard. Buchanan and Brock in their text deciding for others provide us with a strict interpretation of the best interest standard to consider the interest to the child alone. We're asked to weigh the net benefits and burdens of each child, again, to the child alone, focusing on the current and future self-regarding interests of that child. This standard is widely endorsed, including by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the President's Commission on Bioethics, among others. And much of the time, it works very well. And this is an example where I think the best interest standard works quite well, uh, which is acute appendicitis, acknowledging that since I've made this slide, I learned about non-operative treatment for acute appendicitis, <laughs> which actually, I, I might argue, make this, makes this an even better example um, for reasons we'll get to. So we have a seven-year-old girl who is the smallest but the bravest of the 12 girls at her boarding school uh, who has fever and abdominal pain. She has acute appendicitis, and the treatment is surgery. Surgery is in Madeline's best interest. And I would argue that the best interest standard works very well in a case like this, and it does because of a number of features. There's an urgent need for a surgical appendectomy, given the risk for a rupture of appendix and uh, significant morbidity and mortality associated with that. It's a single intervention. It's an intervention of a relatively short duration. The treatment is highly efficacious with limited morbidity. In contrast, there's a certainty of morbidity or mortality with non-intervention. This is a situation where the present and future interests of a precocious seven-year-old are relatively clear, and the intervention itself is relatively inexpensive. Best interest, I would argue, in a case like this works very well. There are a number of criticisms of the best interest standard, however, and we'll, we'll talk about three of the major ones very quickly. The first is the idea of best, that there can only be one. Any fans of fantasy from the mid-80s or early 90s will know what the picture in the corner means. Otherwise, I've kind of outed myself as, as a bit of a nerd. But, uh, <laughs> 
The point is when, when thinking about best, that can be difficult to determine and is inherently value-based. If we were to figure out which is the best cherry pie in a pie contest, do we pick the sweet pie or the tart pie? The pie with crust on top, like the one in the picture, or the one with the lattice crust, or no crust at all? If I were the judge, I would pick the blueberry pie because I don't particularly like cherry pie. That reflects my values. Um, and I would acknowledge that some of the audience may have a different set of values and may come to a different conclusion. Further, the absolute nature of choosing best uh, would go so far as to claim that, that anything other than best is a violation of the physician's duty. Uh, and this would have a number of impacts, one of which would be to remove, in fact, uh, any need for a parent-physician relationship if the physician is obligated to only choose the option that is best for the child's self-regarding interest. And finally, as, as Doug Diekman and many others have argued correctly, we don't apply a best interest standard to daily life, nor do we do it with regularity. In fact, as, as Doug noted, that parents are not required to choose what will be in the very best interest for their child. The choices that they're really required to make are those that avoid clear, preventable, and imminent harms. And he gives the example of the parent who puts their child in the car in the rain to drive to Starbucks to get the parent a latte. While it is not clearly in the child's best interest to travel in the car to the rain to Starbucks, it's also not clearly an incident that we would claim where the parent was acting neglectful or abusive. So with the um, obligatory bioethics picture of a mountain, um, <laughs> I would acknowledge that I accept all of these criticisms of the best interest standard. I would note that no standard for decision making can account for the complex challenges that arises at the end, edge of care. But these criticisms are correct. Um, and best interests are re perhaps better thought of as aspirational, what we clinicians should base our recommendations off of. And in that sense, I think it's still a very useful and widely used construct. More importantly, particularly for this talk, um, I think that much of the moral distress experienced by clinicians practicing in chronic disease in particular, seems to occur when our intuitions do not match what best interest seems to demand, or when an informed parent requests something that differs from our interpretation of the child's best interest. And as I said, I think this happens more in chronic disease. And this is due to a number of factors. Today we'll talk about four of them. One is a lack of data and the resulting uncertainty. Second is our, our understanding of the nature of life-sustaining treatments, and really our language around life-sustaining treatments. Third are situations where it's difficult to know the interests of the child, and fourth, considering the interests of others. To begin with, we'll, we'll talk about uh, uncertainty uh, that can result from a lack of data. Uh, and this was really driven home to me with a case uh, in 2012 when I was a nephrology fellow of Amelia Rivera, who was a three-year-old girl with wolf hirschhorn syndrome, allegedly denied transplant listing at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She had end-stage kidney disease. She was denied a kidney transplant. Uh, also because of her syndrome, she had a significant intellectual disability. This case was hotly debated in the public sphere for a number of weeks, uh, and many people commented on it, including the geneticist Kurt Hirschhorn, Wolf Hirschhorn syndrome, uh, of Wolf Hirschhorn syndrome fame. Uh, and what Dr. Hirschhorn said is that what our ethics committee would tell the parents is that we can't give her a kidney because there's a shortage of kidneys, especially for little kids, and her impairments are too significant. In effect, Dr. Hirschhorn claimed that Amelia could not benefit enough from a transplant to justify its use. And this is very similar to what the parents alleged uh, that the doctors at CHOP told them uh, and what many commentators on the case uh, when it was debated also mentioned. So let's pause here and talk about differences between this case and the case of appendicitis where best interests seem to work very well. Well, there are a number of differences, but I want to highlight the perception, at least in this case, of insufficient benefit for the child. And second, that we're dealing with a much more limited resource. While OR beds are limited, particularly in our institution, um, kidneys are even more limited. And I don't mean to fully single out Dr. Hirschhorn or the doctors at CHOP, because I think this sentiment was fairly widely believed. Uh, and this is supported by data from a 2006 survey of 88 pediatric uh, transplant programs, this is heart, liver, and kidney, at 45 centers uh, in North America. 85% no, uh, of centers considered neurodevelopmental status as part of their assessments when considering a patient as a candidate. However, no center had a formal mechanism to evaluate for intellectual disability. In spite of that, IQ was used as a relative or absolute contraindication by a majority of centers. Perhaps most strikingly, almost 40% of centers reported at least one child who had been evaluated but not listed, but would have had they not had a neurodevelopmental disability. Um, this data is striking, or at least I, I found it to be striking, and in part it was striking because there was a lack of data to actually inform these decisions. 
And to that end, working with Jody Smith, Evelyn Sua, among others, uh, we've conducted a series of trials uh, using data collected from the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients uh, to try and describe the prevalence and, and outcomes of recipients of solid organ transplant with intellectual dis disabilities. Uh, and using this data, with, we created either a broad or narrow definition of intellectual disability. Narrow if you were coded as having a definite impairment in cognitive development along with a delay in academic level or academic progress. Broad, probable impairment in cognitive development along with a delay in academic level or progress. Regardless of the definition you use, you can appreciate that these children are relatively prevalent among transplant recipients. Next, we looked at recipient survival, allograft survival. Uh, in terms of early outcomes. And you see the recipient survival on the screen with the three Kaplan-Meier curves. I'm not gonna go into any more detail on them because as you can appreciate, there's no difference in survival. There was no difference in allograft survival. There was no difference in change in functional status following heart or liver transplant. Such data doesn't exist for kidneys. We thought next about quality of life among our kidney transplant recipients. Um, this is data from Oda and colleagues who reported a Japanese experience of 35 children with intellectual disabilities who received solid organ transplant, kidney transplant, excuse me. Um, and parents were asked to rate on a Likert scale the quality of life for the child, just on a one to five scale, pre and post transplant. This is data that Jody and I have collected among kidney transplant recipients with and without intellectual disabilities here at Seattle Children's using a disease specific validated quality of life measure. There's recipient pre and post score and parent proxy pre and post score. The take home, or at least the first take home from the slide like this, is that in general, kidney transplant improves quality of life. Um, the other take home, which isn't really for today, is that what you see on the screen is the totality of quantitative data that suggests that's in fact the case. A different topic for a different day. But really, let's pause at this point and, and ask, what does all of this have to do with best interests and thinking about best interests? Well, again, if we're considering the self-regarding interest to the child alone, I would argue that this suggests that for a child with intellectual disability and organ failure, transplant is in their best interest. I'll go further and say that this does not necessarily justify their inclusion as transplant candidates. Good transplant allocation policy requires a balance, that of the principles of utility and justice. What much of this data addresses is the utility question, the outcomes, whether they're acceptable. But going a step further, in a series of papers I wrote with Doug Diekman of Eva Goldberg, we argued that these children, in fact, should be considered uh, candidates for solid organ transplant. That if the relevant factors are need, likelihood of success, and duration of success, and if intellectual disability is not at prognostic significance on measurable outcomes for transplants, such as graft survival, length of survival, adherence, and quality of life, then, in fact, the presence and degree of disability should not be considered. To do so is, in fact, unjust. We also argued that these children contribute to the organ pool as a population, which is true, um, and argued that the exclusion of these children exacerbates the existing power imbalance between the medical team and a child with severe intellectual disability and their family. Um, I've thought more about this since uh, we published that paper, and I don't fully agree with that anymore. I think it's more nuanced than that. It's wrong to claim that Amelia Rivera's parents were powerless. They absolutely were not. They launched a national media campaign. They had several hundred thousand signatures on their petition. They changed a state law in New Jersey. They ultimately led to their CHOP to reverse their stance and their child did receive a very successful kidney transplant. So it's wrong to claim that they're powerless. On the other hand, this is a case where a doctor or a group of doctors was able to make a unilateral decision that a child could not benefit sufficiently from a life-sustaining or life-improving treatment. And so in that sense, the criticism still holds, or the argument still holds. And finally, and we'll touch on this later in the talk, these children, like all children, and like all of us for that matter, have value, not only as individuals, uh, but through relationships. Uh, the take home that I, that I want to drive home is that this is a case where I think better data can lead to better application of a best interest standard and ultimately lead to better choices for a child. Next, I want to talk about best interests and in thinking about life-sustaining treatments. Allow me to flip my page. And I want to begin by describing a case uh, published in pediatrics earlier this year. Some of you may have seen it by my former colleague, Laurel Willick. Um, and Dr. Willick presented the case of a three-month-old boy who was admitted to the hospital with failure to thrive. He weighed three kilograms. Uh, the child was found to have a creatinine level of 3.6, severe hydronephrosis, and little renal cortex. This child had previously unrecognized posterior urethral valves. Fulguration of the valves did not lead to improvement. The creatinine level continued to rise. This child now had end-stage kidney disease, and a decision needed to be made about what to do. So we'll pause again and ask what's different between Dr. Willig's case and Madeline's case, where the best interest standard worked very well. 
Well, in this case, we don't have an acute intervention that's required. We have a child with end-stage kidney disease. That's incurable and will require a lifetime of organ replacement treatment. And there's perhaps some uncertainty about efficacy which underlies this and was discussed in Dr. Willick's paper. And I, in practicing pediatric nephrology over the last six years, one of the, th and I'm thinking much, uh, quite a bit about cases and cases like this, what I've really come to appreciate, and, and actually what my boss, Dr. Flynn, made very clear at our last clinic conference, is uh, that organ replacement treatments usually work. What I mean by that is that if the goal of treatment, and speaking about dialysis in this case, is maintaining metabolic balance and improving fluid balance and access can be obtained, then dialysis will almost always work. And I would argue that if the focus is on perfusion, oxygenation, or delivery of calories, the same holds true for mechanical ventilation, ECMO, and intravenous nutrition in chronic organ failure. Now this may strike you as a very narrow interpretation of the goals of, of the, the therapy, and I will grant you that. Um, but even with this narrow interpretation, the treatments will almost always work. So what does this actually have to do with the child's best interest? Well, again, if we're thinking about the self-regarding interest to the child alone, if life-sustaining treatments for chronic organ failure will usually work, then it is likely, perhaps not always, in the child's best interest. This recognition means we need to change our language, our epistemology, uh, surrounding how we talk about life-sustaining treatments in chronic disease. And I've written about a few areas where this comes up with, and we'll touch on two of them very quickly. The first is this question, would you offer dialysis? Which was the second question I got as an attending at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, it occurred at night because they don't, those calls only come at night. Uh, but from a colleague in intensive care calling about a critically ill young child who appeared to have, among other things, end-stage kidney disease. And the question was, would you offer dialysis for this child? And I don't like this question very much, um, and I don't for a number of reasons. The first is this question of you, which I think is imprecise. You could reflect my personal opinion, the consensus of my division, the opinion of pediatric nephrologists in general. What if there's division? Hopefully not among my own opinion, but certainly among members of my division <laughs> or of, of pediatric nephrologists in general, and as I'll illustrate later in the talk, that's certainly the case. What if they thought they were asking my opinion and I thought I was giving them the consensus of uh, nephrologists in general? Well, as there's nine potential combinations here, we only have about an 11% chance of getting it right. Offer is also a, a word that I, I have a harder time with. Offer is to declare one's readiness or willingness. It suggests that I serve as a gatekeeper and steward of the dialysis technology. The vernacular also suggests that dialysis is a valuable commodity. By inference, a positive rather than a neutral or potentially harmful procedure. Would you subject this patient to dialysis might lead to a different response, and I, I suspect might be something that one of my colleagues in intensive care has at least thought about. Um, <laughs> next, we have this issue of futility. So futility is a claim that a treatment cannot achieve its goals. This is why I use a narrow definition. If a treatment cannot achieve its goals and is futile, physicians do not have a duty to provide that treatment, and in fact, probably have a duty not to do so. If dialysis can achieve its goals, if the goal is metabolic balance and fluid removal, it's not futile. That matters because futility is a justification for a physician to make a unilateral decision. If it's not futile, then a unilateral decision not to perform dialysis is not in fact justified. That's not a decision I can make over the phone. And we're better off moving towards shared decision-making, incorporating the patient's values and goals of care. In effect, what I argued is that uh, we should replace this question of would you offer dialysis with two questions. The first of which is, is, di is dialysis technically feasible? And that is a question that I can answer over the phone in many circumstances. And the second, which is more nuanced, is, is dialysis in this child's interest? And that one I can't answer over the phone. That requires meeting with the primary treating team, meeting with the family, meeting the patient, learning about their goals of care, and learning whether dialysis can or cannot help reach those goals. Another area where I think our understanding and language related to life-sustaining treatments and chronic organ failure falls short is the idea of time-limited trials, which have been proposed and adopted increasingly by organizations as a third option when we have initiation versus withholding of life-sustaining treatments. We have time-limited trials as kind of a middle ground. Um, and Quill and Holloway in their paper define them as an agreement between clinicians and the patient or, par or parent surrogate uh, decision makers to use medical therapies over a defined period of time to determine if the patient improves or deteriorates according to agreed upon clinical outcomes. 
I find this to be problematic when thinking about my patients, those with chronic organ failure. To begin with, the time duration is arbitrary. Patient in Dr. Willig's vignette has end-stage kidney disease. They will have end-stage kidney disease their entire life for however long that lasts and require life-sustaining treatments for that entire time period. Whether we set the duration as a day, a week, a month, a year, 10 years, it's arbitrary because the child will always need treatment. It's also very difficult to identify clear, agreed upon objective outcomes, which is what Holloway and Quill require of us. Um, a commonly used criterion, and one that I've used in the past for, for trials uh, in a patient like Dr. Willig's, would be the development of peritonitis, a complication of infection of the peritoneum, which can occur in, in uh, peritoneal dialysis, particularly in younger children. In such a circumstance, we may argue that the pain associated with that complication is so great that we should stop treatment. That's a sign that the treatment has failed. Um, this overlooks a couple of factors. One, that this is very common among infants, occurring in about 50% of cases. Second, that we don't have great ways to predict who will develop peritoneal dialysis or under, uh, I'm sorry, peritonitis and how it will uh, move forward. And third, and perhaps most importantly, peritonitis in many circumstances is treatable with antibiotics and occasionally with surgical replacement of the peritoneal dialysis catheter. So our objective criterion of failure of the treatment is in fact a common and treatable complication. Other seemingly objective criteria, in fact, reflect what the philosopher Robert Veach described as a technical criterion fallacy. What I mean by that is criterion, which are commonly used, such as extubation or cranial ultrasound findings or another neuroimaging findings, don't in fact reflect objective clinical outcome. They reflect, reflect an implicit value judgment made on the clinician's side about the value of certain, of certain lives. So the value of life with requiring a tracheostomy and mechanical ventilation, or the value of life with a significant intellectual disability. Well, I'm gonna pause for a second and, and make clear though, I don't think value judgments are necessarily wrong, and in fact, I think part of the practice of medicine and being a clinician is we owe it to families to give them value-based judgments. We owe it to families to provide recommendations. We need to say why we provide those recommendations, and they have to be based off of the medical data, our experience, or our moral views. Um, but those are all inherently value-based. So it's not, the, the problem is not that it's value-based. The problem is that when we make, when we provide object, seemingly objective criteria like this, we're sidestepping and failing to engage in the key ethical arguments required to justify their use. Finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, in my experience, parents don't think this way in terms of time-limited trials. As part of a project that I'll be discussing later in, in the talk in preparation for that, I had the opportunity to interview a number of parents of children I, I took care of at the University of Wisconsin who either did or did not receive dialysis. Um, and overwhelmingly, they described their experience as the trial of therapy with widely varying time durations, which gets at my first criticism. But really what they described to me is that we would begin treatment until such a time that a complication would occur where the burden associated with the treatment was greater than its benefit. At that point, the treatment would no longer be justified and we would stop. And if the complication never occurred, we would continue treatment indefinitely because the calculus is unchanged. Well, that's not a trial of therapy, that's treatment. Now, with treatment, and when we provide treatment and do it well, we should continually revisit whether the treatment is meeting the goals of care for the patient and the family, whether its benefit continues to exceed its associated burdens. But that is treatment nonetheless. So I would argue that based off of our uh, understanding of chronic organ failure, we should move away from ideas like time-limited trials and stick with and be honest with families and either talk about initiation versus withholding and withdrawal of treatment. Next, I want to talk about considering best interest when it's difficult to know what those interests are. New case, now a two-day-old neonate, prenatally noted anhydramnios and severe renal dysplasia. This is a child we would predict would have severe kidney disease. The child was resuscitated and placed on a high-frequency oscillating ventilator, subsequently weaned to a conventional ventilator, albeit on maximal settings. The child has a grade three bilateral intraventricular hemorrhage. Birth weight is about two kilograms. There's no urine output and the child is becoming volume overloaded. It's likely this child has end-stage kidney disease and pulmonary hypoplasia. The family met with the treating team to discuss treatment options. Excuse me. The treating team recommended comfort care only, but the family disagrees and requests for the team to pursue life-sustaining treatments. This is a complicated case. But what's different from the appendicitis case uh, where best interests worked very well? Well, there's a number of differences, but I would highlight here the difficulty in knowing what the interests of the baby actually are versus the seven-year-old. Uh, and 
here in this case, we have a therapy with limited efficacy, but a certainty of burden. As a quick aside, I just want to touch on why would thoughtful, empathetic doctors recommend comfort care only rather than life-sustaining treatments? Well, they certainly could if there was no chance for cure, and that's true. As I've said a number of times now, end-stage kidney disease is incurable. They could also do so if life will be shortened, and that's also true for this child. No matter what we do, this child will have a shortened lifespan compared to a child who does not have end-stage kidney disease. Now, whether that's days, months, or years will depend in large part on the treatments that are provided, but nonetheless, life will be shortened. If there were burdens associated with the treatment that are placed on the child and on others, and both of those are true in end-stage kidney disease, something we'll come back to. If the treatment is expensive, and it certainly is, or if there's a perception of little or no benefit for the child, if in fact this treatment is not in the child's best interest. Um, what this really gets at is how can the best interest standard be applied for an individual with a limited ability to convey their preferences? And this child has two reasons why they have a limited ability to convey their preferences. First of all, it's a baby. Um, and babies do have a limited ability to convey their preferences. And second, it's a baby with predicted uh, severe intellectual disability. Another reason where it can be difficult to convey preferences. And what this really highlights is another important limitation of thinking about best interest. When we're asked to weigh the net benefits and burdens of each option to the child alone, it may in fact be impossible to do so uh, for children with profound disabilities or where it's very difficult to understand what their interests really are. It can be impossible to identify discrete self-regarding interests or benefits from ongoing existence. In that case, the best interest standard can be reduced to really weighing the pain of treatment versus the pain of not treatment further complicated by the fact that we, we have pain medicines, uh, and the pain in many but not all circumstances can be treated. Now, some may note that, that this, we're using the wrong standard in this case, and that's the reason why we're falling into trouble. And Doug Diegma has given us the harm principle, which is an alternative standard to consider uh, when parents make a request that we're concerned about. The harm principle serves as a threshold for clinicians to consider requesting state intervention to prevent parents from causing likely imminent and serious harms. It's usually applied in the setting of a refusal, and in that sense, is really a negative standard used to define what parent choices should not be permitted. I would again note, though, that this still relies primarily on an assessment of benefits and burdens to the child alone. To better illustrate this, and getting back to our case, surgery in this case to place a dialysis catheter would be painful for the child, albeit something that could be treated with pain medications. At the same time, however, successful dialysis could lead to treatment of volume overload and uremia, which would decrease pain for the child. I would also note that the parent's request does not place the child at risk for serious preventable harms compared to the alternative of comfort care only. But what I hope that this really makes clear, if this found, uh, feels a little bit silly, I, I think it is, is that examining the child's self-regarding interest alone is insufficient. And there's an elephant in the room that we haven't talked about yet. And what I, what I think that is, is that we've overlooked the value of the caring relationship between the parent and the child. In effect, what I think that this case illustrates that we're missing out on is that families matter. And there aren't great definitions of families or what it means to be in a family, but I like this one from the sociologist Carol Levine. Ms. Levine describes family members as individuals who by birth, adoption, marriage, or declared commitment share deep personal connections and are mutually entitled to receive and obligated to provide support of various kinds to the extent possible, especially in times of need. Now, Ms. Levine wasn't talking about a family like the one in our case. She was describing the communities uh, that surrounded uh, young gay men with AIDS in the beginning of the AIDS crisis. But I think it still applies beautifully, and, and she's right. The family is a moral community, and individuals do not exist in isolation within it, but rather in a web of relationships, and that these relationships should not be ignored. Recognizing the value of family and the value of relationships, and working with Ben Wolfon and Jennifer Kett, uh, we've proposed development of a, of a relational potential standard as a supplement to best interest. The relational potential standard was originally developed by the philosopher John Aris, whose central insight was recognition that the relationships with others are part of the basic human goods that make life worth living. Our proposal of a relational potential standard as a supplement for best interests uses a care ethics-based framework to provide justification, which is based on the recognition that the caring relationship between the parent and the child is morally meaningful. It's intertwined and its value cannot be understood in individualistic terms of standard moral theories designed to maximize satisfaction or interest for a particular individual. This is a case where the sum is in fact greater than the parts. If we acknowledge the, that this relationship is morally meaningful, we also need to recognize that no parent can meet their child's needs alone. 
whether they have disability, significant medical needs, or otherwise. If that's the case, then society, and in turn clinicians, owe it to families to help provide support to allow parents to meet their duties to their child, which could be done through medical treatments. To illustrate this graphically, we've talked so far about decision-making, focusing particularly on self-regarding interests to the child, thinking about burdens and benefits. We've talked about best interests, which is designed to maximize burdens and minimize benefits. We've talked briefly about uh, the harm principle, which exists as a threshold below which the harms are too great. If we shift and focus on the child-parent relationship, while still keeping the harm principle in case, we should never overlook treatments and avoiding harm for children should always be a primary duty of clinicians. Our thinking about best interest no longer fits as well, but certainly benefits can be in place and perhaps a relational potential standard could serve as a moral justification to support an informed parent's request for life-sustaining treatment in such a circumstance. I think this is supported by this uh, study done by Janvier and colleagues, uh, where they reported a survey data on 159 uh, parents of children with trisomy 13 or 18 who survived over three months. 98% of these parents reported their child enriched their life and their family's life. As one parent put it, we loved her as we love our other children. Our children have value. We don't love our kids because of their accomplishments. We love our kids because they are our kids. And I, I want to be very clear here. The parent is not saying that the child enriched my life. They're saying it enriched our life. The, the relationship was meaningful. It was enriching within the family. Now, there are objections to a, a relational-based uh, standard, such as the one that, that we've proposed. Uh, criticizing our, our work, uh, Brian Carter argued that this would lead to objectification of children. It could lead to children being treated solely as a means to their parents' end, violating the Kantian categorical imperative. McGraw and Perlman, two neonatologists, argued that acting in a manner of recognizing relationships would lead to pediatricians abdicating the best interest standard in deference to parental autonomy. In effect, they argued that such positions would no longer be acting as moral agents. Regarding this criticism of objectification of children, it's worth remembering that such criticism was historically applied to providing treatments to children with trisomy 21, spina bifida, and many other treatments. I would also acknowledge again that showing respect to the child requires limiting pain and preventing or removing burdens whenever possible. That never goes away. But also that in a caring relationship, the interests of the caregiver and the one who is cared for are interwoven. And providing requested treatment for an informed parent, the clinician is in fact supporting that caring relationship. What of this criticism that pediatricians acting in this manner have abdicated their role as moral agents? Well, I would say that a clinician who recognizes relational potential and supports an informed parent request for life-sustaining therapy have not abdicated the best interest standard. Uh, they've acknowledged the limitations of it. And they recognize the moral worth and import of the parent-child relationship. These physicians do remain moral agents. In effect, families matter. And so what, what I want to talk, and the relationships within the matter as well. Next, I want to talk about those others in the relationships. And so finally, we, we're going to conclude by talking about the interests of others when we think about best interest. Um, and I'm going to begin with, with this aphorism attributed to Dr. Bella Schick, who was one of the giants in pediatrics in the first half of the 20th century. As chair of pediatrics at Mount Sinai, Dr. Schick led a number of advancements, including the development of the Schick test, which led to the treatment and eradication of diphtheria. But he was also uh, well quoted. There's an entire book of his aphorisms. Uh, and this was the one that I liked the most. Um, a pediatrician has three important clients, the child, the child, and the child. And this fits beautifully with the best interest standard, right? So if we're to consider the self-regarding interest to the child, their present and future interests alone, we're thinking about the child, the child, and the child. So perhaps really what I should be saying is that families matter to a point. I wanna go back to Dr. Willig's case that we talked about earlier that of a three-month-old boy who presented with failure to thrive, was found to have end-stage kidney disease. In that case, Dr. Willig writes that the nephrology team recommended dialysis, but the family refused. And they refused because they said they didn't want their child to suffer, and they noted the pain that would be associated with placement of a peritoneal dialysis catheter. But they were also concerned about the impact on their two other children, impact on their family, and loss of income that could be related to this. So what, again, is different from the, best, uh, the appendicitis case where best interest standards seem to work very well? Well, there's a number of differences, but I would highlight again this question of efficacy, which underlies some of this debate, along with the impact on others and again expense. 
So we'll deal with the efficacy question very quickly. This is data published by Kerry, who actually works at the same center as Dr. Willick, um, reporting outcomes from the NAPRTIX data set, which is a national consortium that we participate in. So uh, this is reporting five-year survival for children initiating dialysis between 2000 and 2012. The red line is the one we care about. That's for children who are initiating in the first year. As you can see, survival is greater than 80%. And this is data that's been replicated in other large groups. In spite of that very good survival rate, these are, this is data from three different international surveys of pediatric nephrologists. Pediatric nephrologists consistently, a portion of them at least, feel that parents should be able to refuse renal replacement therapies for their young infant or young child. And why is that? I think that has to do with family interests. In a very nice study done of uh, interviews of pediatric nephrologists regarding cases where dialysis was withheld or withdrawn in French-speaking pediatric nephrology centers in Europe, uh, Foriel and colleagues noted that burdens placed on family was one of the major reasons for withholding or withdrawing. In the European Pediatric Dialysis Working Group guidelines, our only guideline for infant dialysis, they note that we should consider the predicted quality of life for the child and the family. Obviously, this is my own emphasis added. Um, when making recommendations about initiating, withholding, or withdrawing dialysis. And the ethicist Cynthia Cohen, writing now more than 30 years ago on this topic, wrote that what will be asked of parents will be more heroic than has ever been asked of parents before. They'll become amateur intensivists in charge of what is, in effect, a home-based intensive care unit for their very young infants. I'll acknowledge that Dr. Cohen wrote this two generations of dialysis technology ago, and in that time we've also had improvements in our nursing care, pain control, nutrition that we can provide, uh, and support for families. But in many ways I think this, this uh, commentary still applies. And I think it is informative when you think about how I was trained uh, to have this conversation about dialysis. And I, I, not to out any of my mentors, I've, I've spoken with a number of folks both nationally and internationally, and this is pretty standard for how this conversation goes. So for a patient like the one of Dr. Willicks, after talking about what kidneys do, what end-stage kidney disease is, and what dialysis is, we conclude with something like this. Dialysis is hard. One of you will have to quit your job. It'll be a big stress on your marriage or your relationship. It'll be a big financial stress. Your other kids will get less attention and you'll miss out on things. But we think you should do this. So, in effect, what I'm really saying is that, is that dialysis in this case causes marital stress, poverty, divorce, depression, neglect of other children, and missed life opportunities. Now, you could ask, what, what among this is anecdote? What, what actually is supported by data? But perhaps the first question, and we'll talk about that, but the first question we should ask is, what does this actually have to do with the child's best interest? And if we're thinking about self-regarding interest to the child alone, I would argue it has nothing to do with the child's best interest. That doesn't feel quite right, though. Um, and I think the reason is because we're overlooking that other moral agents, in fact, are impacted by medical decision-making for children with chronic illness. Parents, siblings, and families are impacted by these decisions. Recognizing this, the philosopher Thomas Murray, writing in his book, The Worth of a Child, notes that parents are finite human beings. They possess finite resources, emotional, physical, and financial resources. Murray goes on to note that an exceptionally needy child may take up so much of a parent's emotional and physical energy and financial resources to make them unable to meet the needs of other children of themselves. He argues that if the worth of the parent-child relationship is judged by how successfully it avoids unpleasantness and increases pleasures, if physicians can foretell prognosis, and if the burdens of raising a child with chronic illness are most likely to fall on the parent, especially the mother, then it would seem reasonable to defer decision-making authority to the caregiver in such a case. So I said I would get back to what actually is supported by data, uh, and I looked. So marital stress, the answer is probably. Divorce, no. I looked at a number of centers, including ours in the US. The take home is that a lot of Americans get divorced, uh, but not necessarily more so if your child is on dialysis. Poverty, that appears to be more experiential. Depression, maybe. There's one study in South Korea that shows an association between uh, parents, mothers rather, of children on peritoneal dialysis have slightly higher rates of me uh, medical uh, depression. Neglect of other children, missed life opportunities, that again falls into the experiential area. You might also, on, on hearing my presentation, uh, it might have dawned on you that I was missing something. I didn't touch on the, seemingly the other half of uh, the discussion, as I, I certainly didn't mention any positive effects. What about family adaptation and resilience, the reason many of us are pediatricians in the first place? Social support that's provided by the dialysis staff, which is consistently reported by parents. Not from the doctors, from the nurses, just, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> 
What, what about the benefit of the individual as a member of the family? Something that, that we've, we've touched on earlier. What I really think that this leaves us with is two questions. The first is what actually are the burdens placed upon family members of children with complex chronic and burdensome conditions like end-stage kidney disease? And second, and, and, um, is what is it permissible then to incorporate these interests or burdens into medical decision making for such children? Uh, and with the support of the CCTR CRISP program, I spent the last four and a half or so years trying to answer the first question to begin to inform the second one. Um, working with Doug Opel uh, and a few other folks, uh, we've been conducting semi-structured interviews of 35 uh, pediatric dialysis caregivers uh, here at Seattle Children's, at Texas Children's, and at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin uh, in Milwaukee. And I'll devote one, one slide to, to talking about our, our results uh, in terms of what we've learned about the caregiver experience. First is this idea of medicalization, which is fundamental. Parents describe to us that they have two roles, that of the nurturer who promotes development for their child and that of the medical provider, and that these roles often compete and in fact conflict with each other. They describe the time of end-stage kidney disease diagnosis and dialysis initiation as an inflection point. Everything changes at this start. This is true even for children who had chronic kidney disease beforehand. Um, and it sends parents off in directions, and it, uh, according to us, appears to, to change along three axes, that of pragmatic adaptation, emotional adjustment, and social adjustment. So it's best to think about this graphic as a continuum, which parents move along, either in areas towards burden or, or towards opportunities for growth. When we talk about pragmatic adaptation, parents mourn the loss of their identity. Loss of identity as a worker, of a parent of a healthy child. And more in their loss of spontaneity, it's very common to describe being chained to dialysis. Um, and in fact, many parents do describe that they enter poverty as a result of having a child with end-stage kidney disease. Others are able to adapt their identity, adopt the new schedule, and thrive in that manner. When we talk about emotional adjustment, many parents describe maladapting coping mechanisms of hypervigilance to the point of pathology, of having to be in the dialysis unit every minute with their hand wrapped around the catheter because they know what the other end of that catheter goes to, and if they don't hold it, they can't protect their child. Um, of derealization, of feeling withdrawn from their experience as a parent, and of vicarious traumatization. While we didn't assess for this specifically, many of the parents that we studied expressed symptoms uh, and met a diagnosis for medical traumatic stress. I would highlight that the condition of medical traumatic stress was described among parents of children with cancer, trauma, and burns, all conditions which have either a relatively short or intermediate duration. End-stage kidney disease, as I've now said six times, is a lifetime of treatment. Um, these parents never really get to hit that recovery phase. On the other hand, many parents were able to accept their child's diagnosis, the change in their life and their child's life, were able to develop healthy coping mechanisms and, in fact, knowledge and insight. We talked about social, uh, we learned about social adjustment. Trust, particularly trust of the medical team, was paramount. Those parents who did, could not trust the medical team found their time spent in the medical environment, which is significant, as a time of compounding existing stigmatization and isolation, which can occur in chronic disease or being a member of an underrepresented minority or ethnic group. Conversely, those who were able to trust their medical providers, their treating team, found the time spent in the dialysis unit on the phone with the dialysis nurses or in clinic, all of which are extensive, um, as a time of support, as a time of respite, of learning, uh, and in fact, personal growth. Uh, and they, parents, as a rule, did describe new relationships that they formed that were meaningful with dialysis staff uh, and particularly with other parents of children with chronic disease. And, and finally, this idea of advocacy. All parents expressed the desire to be advocates for their child and, in fact, were, and, and I expected to learn that. Uh, what was striking to me, and, and perhaps shouldn't have been, uh, was the desire of many of these parents to be advocates for others. To have their child get a transplant so they could go back to work so they could give money to hospital to provide uncompensated care for other children to start a foundation to aid other families of children with chronic disease who are struggling with finances, or to lobby at the local, state, or federal level to provide better support for children with chronic illness and their families. To summarize, does dialysis cause marital stress? Yes. Divorce? Yes. Poverty? Yes. Depression? Yes. Neglect of other children? Yes. Missed life opportunities? Yes. Are there positive effects? Yeah. Do we see evidence of family adaptation and resilience? We did. Was there social support provided by the dialysis staff? Yes. Did families benefit by having this individual as a member? Yes. Were the relationships meaningful? Absolutely. So what are we actually learning? Caregivers in pediatric dialysis do experience extraordinary burdens, some of which do, in fact, exceed the threshold described by Murray. 
But this experience varies significantly, both between individuals and within individuals over time. It's a dynamic process. Uh, it can ebb and flow. We can see times where burdens are great or burdens are lesser and opportunities of growth are greater. It doesn't necessarily move linearly over time from one uh, in a positive or negative direction, uh, but rather is dynamic. This work has highlighted the importance of developing targeted interventions to improve the lives of caregivers and families. And to that end, we're working right now to develop a pediatric dialysis caregiver burden tool so that targeted interventions, we can actually assess their efficacy. But what does this tell us about decision making? And I'll pause here and highlight that what I've been talking about for the last 40 minutes really represents the last four or five years of my work, but is really a, a work in progress. Uh, and there's much more to be done. But what I think this suggests, and, and where I think this is heading is that there does need to be a role for family interests. That family interests may and in fact probably should uh, be considered in decisions to initiate, withhold, or withdraw life-sustaining medical therapies. Not, I want to highlight there should never be the sole consideration, however. Um, the interests of the patient should play a role, as should societal interests. Um, but there has to be some type of middle ground. Um, and these are a number of factors that I think could play a role in, in thinking about that, and, and some of you may think of something else or disagree entirely. Um, what I mean is that if the survival of an intervention, following an intervention, is expected to be high with low morbidity, family interests ought to play a much lesser role than the alternative. Conversely, if there's an expectation that the child will soon become an autonomous decision maker, family interests should play a much less of a role than if there's an expectation the child will never become an autonomous decision maker. If the time frame of intervention is expected to be long, family interests should play a greater role than if the intervention is short. If the burdens placed on family are high, it would make more sense to think more about family interests than if the burdens placed on the family were low. Similarly, if societal uh, resources were abundant and we could support families fully, we shouldn't think about family interests in the same way as if in situations where societal resources are lacking. Could inclusion of family interests lead to unlimited treatment withdrawal? I think this is unlikely, as the overwhelming majority of parents do express a strong preference for life-sustaining uh, treatments for their child. And the children with extremely complex and chronic and burdensome conditions are relatively rare. And that for other children, the relative balance of interests may be quite different. And the relative strengths of parental or familial interests uh, may be less. Are there other alternatives to considering family interests? Well, in a just society, we would provide support to families of seriously ill children so parents would not have to consider their own limited ability to care for the child in weighing the future quality of life for the child and the family. Unfortunately, I, I don't think that we currently live in such a just society. Um, CPS, and I don't mean to denigrate CPS here, exists as a safety net for children, but again, is, is an imperfect option. Adoption or foster care would be another option, but this again assumes that society can fulfill its duty to all members and overlooks the possibility that the impact on adoptive parents may be just as great. To sum up, we've spent the last 45 or so minutes questioning the role of best interest standard. I, I hope that you, you have learned something from listening to me babble. Um, but more than that, I, I hope you appreciate that there is, is in fact much more work to be done. That the best interest standard is important in pediatric medical decision making, but offers incomplete guidance for children with complex and chronic conditions. That good ethics require good facts, and this reinforces the importance of good clinical research to lead to better and more informed treatment decisions. That life-sustaining treatments usually work for children with chronic organ failure, and our language should reflect this when we talk about it. That families matter to a point. But really, what the last uh, kind of four or five years have sort of taught me, uh, and my major take home as I was putting this talk together, is that in most circumstances, Unless, unless a clear instance of harm, we, and, and I really mean that in the royal sense, so I suppose me, uh, are better off maintaining humility, of moving away from the absolutism that the best interest standard seems to demand, of taking time to talk with families and identify their goals of care and provide our expertise and recommendations to help them achieve, if possible, their goals through a model of shared decision making. Um, with that, I, I have a number of people to thank, uh, but in particular, my, my patients, uh, their families, my research participants, the CCTR CRISP program, uh, and those two little guys who make everything worthwhile. So with that, um, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Whiteman. I, I, as I suggested, go to a lot of grand rounds, and I never uh, either think or feel more than when I come to the ethics conferences. Uh, we'll take some questions here. And before I forget, please make sure and fill out an evaluation for Dr. Whiteman, if you will. Be so kind. They're in the back. Just give them to Emily or to Kathy. Questions? Uh, 
Uh, th thank you, Aaron. That was a great talk. I actually have a very simple question because there was one slide just a few moments ago that I just got confused on. Unlimited treatment withdrawal. Somehow, I think I wasn't paying attention carefully enough. I didn't understand what that meant. Can you just clarify what you're talking about? Sure. What, what the, the, a criticism of thinking about the role of family in medical decision making is that if we are prioritizing the family interests or providing even recognition of family interests, it could lead to greater withdrawal of potentially efficacious treatment for children, up to the point of unlimited withdrawal of treatment. What about the flip side of that? And I think we hear that worry that um, family-centered care has gone too far and that we're allowing families to make all decisions. So the sort of flip side would be, would the um, relational potential standard lead to unlimited parental insistence upon treatment that a team thinks is inappropriate? So that's that's the, the big question, right? So I, 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 there's two ways to think about it. So, so first is... is um, I talked briefly about values and, and, and the importance of values when doctors make recommendations. And I, 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 I want to highlight again the importance and the centrality of, of making recommendations in terms of what we do. We owe it to families to make a strong recommendation, to tell them what we think is best and why. Um, a family doesn't necessarily have to agree with us, um, but we do owe it to them to inform them of, of our, our thoughts and why. Um, in terms of thinking about inappropriate or appropriate, we have to think about what, what that actually means. Um, and so if there is a decision that can be made, um, we tend to think that there are at least two options that are choices that exist. We may think that one is better, but if there's a decision to be made and there's two choices, uh, then presumably we would permit a parent to make either choice. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Aaron, that was a great talk. Uh, some of us in the audience, uh, me, were here as a nephrologist before dialysis and transplant were even available. So, that it, so the discussion and the issues are quite different without any evidence of benefit. And uh, so I, I wonder about the, the uh, two questions, really. One, we're, we're blessed because of the challenges of dialysis were brought up. So Medicaid, Medicare pays for, provides uh, financial payment for renal replacement. It doesn't for heart or kidney or for liver or other life-saving things. So that it has a different financial impact on families uh, in society and, and even whether it can be provided in certain venues. So that's, that's one thing that, that I'd be curious about. But what about how the lack of evidence of quality of life and the things that you've talked about exist? And say, even if the artificial kid, wearable kidney comes around and it's been tested only in adults <laughs> and uh, it might provide benefit, it might not, that sort of thing. How, how does that affect these discussions, and I, I say that from someone who's been a very um, much uh, supporter of, of taking the child's interest and in, criticized early in my career for, for having the option to do these things. So, so I'm curious when evidence for uh, benefit to the child and evidence for harm to the family exists. Yeah, um, both good questions. So, so regarding the cost question, um, you're right, that is, is a relevant consideration at an institutional level um, and a relevant, uh, but not perhaps on a case-by-case -case level, and I, I think that's the distinction. Um, and so I, and I, 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 if we think that the treatment works and is efficacious, it seems uh, disability rights scholars would note that, that in fact, the debate about cost only seems to come up when we have another perception for why, why that child perhaps should not be a, a candidate based off of cognition. Um, the, the other question about innovative treatments and, and treatments where there, there isn't data uh, to support it, well, if, if we think that it might improve quality of life, and I agree with you, I, I think an artificial, the wearable kidney could uh, be a great improvement. I, I found Raj's, uh, Raj Munshi, uh, Dr. Raj Munshi, our director of dialysis, who's been involved in, in those projects, his presentation's very uh, inspiring. Um, 
we owe it to children if it's safe to try and, and get them involved in it as, as quickly as we can. We also owe it to children to study whether or not that in fact does improve quality of life. And I, I would highlight that, that I don't want to make you seem old, Bruder, but um, <laughs> we, we've been doing dialysis and transplant for a while now and there, there really ought to be better data uh, that suggests that it, it impacts quality of life one way or the other than, than what actually exists. Hey, Aaron, thanks for that talk. Um, I was wondering if you know if there's any, um, has been any study on the recommendations that teams make to families when they kind of take their values and try to make a recommendation of whether to pursue um, like highly intense treatments like transplant or continuous renal replacement therapy, and if there's any disparities among the families, like based on the recommendations, like if we, based on like implicit biases, are more likely to recommend comfort care for families that are maybe lower socioeconomic status or? So uh, that's a good question. I don't believe there are in pediatrics. Uh, in the adult world there are. There is data that suggests that children who are uh, minorities or, or from a minority ethnic group were slower to be uh, certainly recommended and put forward for evaluation for transplantation. Um, and that's well documented. Um. So going back to the new principle that you guys are sort of proposing, kind of looking at relationship, I think one problem that I have is it, it kind of pairs together something that's very value loaded on kind of what a fam what a this child brings to a family, kind of love, sort of these sort of relational things. But then at the bottom it throws in <clears throat> kind of parent ability and means. And you had made a comment that kind of society kind of ought to mitigate challenges in that arena to help support parents if they have their own medical illnesses or, um, but I think the reality is that society does not provide that kind of support. So how do you, how do you, how do you implement a principle like that in kind of factoring in systematic privilege and oppression if, um, and how do you, kind of the troubling issue of taking a single low income kind of impoverished parent who child may need nursing care, whose parent can't work, who's living on SSI, who may end up in a situation where we're calling CPS because they can't safely care for the child anymore, versus what the presentation seems to discuss more sort of this system of like a well-resourced family where one parent has the option to take off work. And so how do you avoid the troublesome nature of making decisions based on societal inequities? You can't. Um, no, 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 that, that, very, very important point. I don't mean to be flippant. Um, I, I would offer two, two quick responses. First is that society does have a duty to support the relationship. It does it in other ways too. That's, that's you know, part of the justification for why we all provide taxes um, so we can provide education for other people's kids, um, why we pay taxes so that we can support Medicaid to provide medical care for other people's kids. Um, so that, that is are examples of societal uh, duties towards supporting that relationship. Um, but what, what you get at is, is really kind of a fundamental question in ethics of whether, whether we should be advocating for what we think is, is the right thing, even if it could for a particular individual lead to a worse result. Um, and that is something that is not resolved uh, and something that has been uh, found throughout both in the debate about best interest standard, because that was originally the debate. Uh, when the, when I was at Wisconsin, I, I worked a lot with Norm Faust as, as one of my mentors, as one of the, the giants in, in pediatric bioethics. And Dr. Faust's first major case was the, the, the case, the Hopkins baby, which was a, 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 a version of, of the baby doe case, a baby with trisomy 21, um, where the, with the esophageal atresia, and the thought was that it was in this child's best interest to provide treatment. On the other hand, providing treatment was going to lead to a family that, for a child who didn't want this child, the child was going to be institutionalized as a result. Um, it was still the right thing, but perhaps it would have led to the long, and that was one of the major criticisms uh, when uh, during the initial debate about what to do about babies with trisomy 21. So that you, you raise a really important and uh, actually rather old point in, in, in bioethics. Maybe one more. I always have to get one in. Uh, Dr. Whiteman, are the conversations of these nature any different in countries where there may be better financial and social support, such as perhaps people, uh, countries where there are national health services, et cetera, where there may be less long-term financial burden for the families? 
I thought you were going the other direction. I, I believe that is true. Um, that in, in Scandinavia, uh, in countries like that, that, the discussion is, is different in that regard. Um, there are perhaps some differences with a more homogenous population as well and, and less plurality of views uh, and values, but, but that does seem to be the case. Well, Dr. Whiteman, thank you so much for a phenomenal talk. Really appreciate that. Everyone, fill out your forms, please. Thank you.